right, thanks. And uh, I really want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today. I'm going to talk about HIV research in low and middle income countries. And you know, perhaps most of what I'm going to say is uh, it's, it's going to be a repetition of what has been said, but I do want to emphasize some aspects and components of uh, HIV cure research in uh, low and middle income countries where I think much more needs to be done in order to um, fast track this uh, kind of research. So first of all, just to say that there has been tremendous uh, progress in H HIV treatment and prevention, obviously right from uh, the beginning when uh, there were many, one had to take very many pills uh, up to today where it's one pill a day. And very soon, even in, uh, particularly in, uh, in uh, uh, richer countries, uh, people will be getting carbotegravia, which one can take once every two uh, every two months. So I think then the question becomes, why should we uh, then care about HIV cure? Uh, what are the challenges of HIV cure, particularly for people living in uh, low and middle income countries? Uh, and what are some of the uh, promising uh, strategies for HIV cure in this setting? And then I want to give an example of HIV cure research from a low and middle income country from uh, the fresh cohort that I'm involved in. Um, so first of all, the need for HIV cure, I think is obvious, particularly for those of us who live in uh, low and middle income countries. This is data that we published last year from our cohort here in KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, um, in South Africa, where you can see that the uh, prevalence of HIV is very high, particularly in this uh, age group of 25 to 44 years, where the approach is about 60% in women and 35% uh, in men. So even if you're able to stop all new infections going forward, we have, we have a very high proportion of people that are living with HIV and these individuals will have to live with HIV for the rest of their lives. And I think it behoves us as a community uh, to look for ways uh, to cure HIV so that people don't have to take antiretroviral therapy uh, for the rest of their lives, if that, if that were to be possible. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to emphasize is that uh, there has been a lot of research that shows that uh, even though antiretroviral therapy definitely improves the quality of life and everybody who is living with HIV should be put on antiretroviral therapy, um, anti HIV itself or antiretroviral therapy, and sometimes it's not very clear whether it's HIV or the antiretroviral therapy is associated with a lot of um, conditions uh, such as uh, higher risk of cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, and neurocognitive abnormalities, um, and reduce the life expectancy. Obviously, this is improving as more people go on antiretroviral therapy earlier. But uh, what it means is that, uh, particularly in high burden countries such, such as South, South Africa, these conditions are likely to continue to be a, 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 a problem. Uh, this, this is likely to be a problem uh, going forward. And so I think it's obvious that we need to look for an HIV uh, cure. I think the other reason, particularly for again, for those of us that live in uh, low and middle income countries is the funding has stagnated over the last decade. Uh, and this is, this, was, this is data before COVID. And you can see that uh, uh, the funding for HIV programs has really stagnated. And in fact, we missed the 2020 targets that were set by the uh, UNAIDS for new uh, funding to sustain the current uh, HIV uh, programs. And of course, now with COVID, I know that the resources uh, available for HIV prevention and for HIV treatment have definitely gone down. And so I think we have to continue to look for other ways to deal with HIV um, in addition to the current uh, prevention strategies as well as the current treatment strategies and see whether we can actually eradicate HIV from our communities. So I think uh, you, most of you will probably be familiar with this figure where uh, the reason that uh, although antiretroviral therapies are very uh, successful in suppressing viremia, they are not curative. And as soon as antiretroviral therapy is interrupted, there is vi viral rebound in a vast majority of people and uh, this damages the immune system. And so 
uh, antiretroviral therapy is long life, and uh, we need to look for ways uh, to cure HIV. So why why is this the case? Why is uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, lifelong? Uh, the the reason for this is that um, uh, in the absence of antiretroviral therapy, there's productive infection of cells where the cells have HIV DNA in them and they, they are RNA positive as well, and they produce HIV proteins. And these cells mostly will die as a result of HIV infection. But there are some cells that are in the body that are actually latently infected uh, with HIV, and these cells will have HIV DNA in the chromosome, but they will be RNA positive. So they are transcriptionally, what we call transcriptionally silent. They're not producing HIV RNA, and they, are, they also do not uh, produce HIV protein. And because of the fact that they don't produce HIV protein, these cells cannot be seen by the immune system. And these cells can survive for many years. They can survive for decades. And these are uh, particularly CD4 memory, CD4 T cells, they can survive in the body for very many years. And at one point or another, they get become activated and they start producing uh, virus again, particularly in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. Now we know that uh, there are instances where um, uh, HIV, you know, these cells are very rare in the body. Uh, this kind of cartoon, uh, this uh, illustrate this that this that this HIV, these uh, cells that have a HIV uh, DNA are very rare and they are very difficult to detect. They are no, they are about one in a million CD4 T cells. And there are no good markers for identifying these cells that are latently infected with HIV. So there's no way to really easily uh, get rid of these cells uh, from circulation. These cells also hide in tissues such as lymph nodes, the gastrointestinal tract, and the central nervous system. And therefore, uh, they are very difficult to get to um, and to eliminate from the body. Now, when you talk about HIV cure, we're talking about uh, really eliminating or reducing these latently infected cells. And there are two ways to do this. One is to completely eliminate these uh, latently infected cells. And this would be what we call um, uh, sterilizing cure. It's probably not a very good word, uh, uh, but what it means is that you completely eradicate HIV uh, from circulation and from the body. And that has been achieved in a few cases. And I'm going to talk about that uh, briefly. Uh, and that would uh, be eradication. But the other way to get rid of these cells is to continuously reduce these cells, slowly reduce the number of these latently infected cells from the body uh, to an extent that even if you don't completely eradicate them, uh, the body by itself is able to control uh, HIV uh, infection such that when antiretroviral therapy is withdrawn, even if there is a recognition of um, infection, it is at such low levels and the body is able to keep it at uh, very low levels so that the virus cannot cause disease in the person uh, or uh, and that the virus cannot be transmitted to somebody else. And the way to achieve this is through the immune system uh, primarily. So you can reduce these cells in the body, but then they, in order for you to do that, they have to be seen by the immune system so that they can be eliminated by cytotoxic T cells uh, natural killer cells, antibodies, and other immune mechanisms. Now, this is a, a, of course, HIV eradication is possible and has been demonstrated in a few cases, as I will show in the next slide. But the other way is to uh, activate uh, or uh, boost the immune uh, response in an HIV infected person so that they're able to continually reduce uh, the HIV reservoir. Uh, to such an extent that the body itself controls uh, HIV without antiretroviral therapy. But this, this is probably the most, this second approach of reducing the reservoir is probably the most practical at the moment, uh, for particularly for resource uh, limited settings. And I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. But HIV cure is possible, we know, uh, and eradication from the body. We know that from a few cases. The, the most famous case is this case of uh, Timothy Brown. Uh, but this case of HIV cure involved complicated gene therapy uh, that involved uh, bone marrow transplant. We know also uh, from uh, cord, this is now possible from cord blood in the recent case that was reported 
Uh, but most of this, uh, these cases of HIV, complete HIV eradication, are not safe and they are not affordable for most. You know, they involve complicated bone marrow transplant or uh, ablation of cells, immune cells in the person who is H uh, living with HIV. And uh, that in itself can be uh, a very complicated medical procedure. And it is certainly not affordable for most people living in low and, and middle income countries. So although this, we should continue to pursue this line of research, uh, it's certainly, I don't think it's uh, one that is uh, ready uh, for rollout uh, in uh, resource rich countries, leave alone, uh, you know, resource limited uh, settings. But the other, the other um, ways to approach HIV cure then is to look for remission, long-term remission. Cases where you don't completely eliminate HIV, but where the immune system or the body by itself through mechanisms that we don't fully understand is able to control viremia. And we know that that is possible because we have what we call natural HIV controllers. Uh, the most famous subset of these individuals is so-called elite controllers. These are individuals who maintain viral load below the levels of detection and they can uh, and they have normal CD4 counts. They can pretty much live normal lives uh, in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. But to that, uh, group of individuals is very rare. It's uh, less than 1% of HIV uh, infected individuals. And so what we need to do is to study uh, these HIV controllers more um, to understand what is this, what are the mechanisms that lead to HIV control in these individuals. But the other group of individuals are the so-called post-treatment controllers. These are individuals who go on antiretroviral therapy. Um, the viral load goes to undetectable because they're on antiretroviral therapy. And, but when antiretroviral therapy is interrupted, the viral load does not rebound. So there's no rebound as you would expect uh, you know, to happen in the vast majority of people where you expect that after a few weeks of antiretroviral therapy, there is rebound of uh, viremia. But there's a few cases, uh, about 10% of individuals, particularly those who start antiretroviral therapy quite early, uh, or very soon after acute infection, where the virus does not rebound. Again, the mechanisms are not completely clear. And so this is not something that can be done, um, you know, uh, unless it is really under, under, you know, clinical care or under clinical research care. Uh, but we know that this is possible because there's a few uh, individuals that, that have uh, undergone this. So how do we achieve this? Um, uh, remission, long-term remission of HIV. There are many uh, strategies that have been uh, attempted and uh, some of them are listed here. There are two groups of these mechanisms. The uh, first group of mechanisms targets the virus itself. So you look for ways to eliminate these latently infected cells. And the other approach is to boost the immune uh, response so that the immune response is then able to control uh, viremia. And some of the strategies that have been uh, uh, attempted are broadly neutralizing antibodies, which uh, Marina has uh, explained uh, very eloquently. Uh, T cell vaccines are a possibility, other forms of immunomodulation, uh, all a combination of these approaches. So approaches that target the virus, such as very early treatment and combinations of broadly neutralizing antibodies. And some of those, uh, approaches when they are combined as a combination of approaches have been shown to be effective and uh, to result in long-term remission. So um, how, Jumbi, how, how- may I interrupt you? Could you go back to that slide? Yes, please. So I just wanted to ask your question, like, so out of all these different strategies, do you think which of these are um, researchable or testable in low and middle income countries? I think that the one of uh, early, early treatment plus combination of broadly neutralizing antibodies and immunomodulation mm -hmm. is one that is definitely testable in uh, low and middle income countries. And in my next slides, okay. Um, okay. I am going to talk about the fresh cohort where we are actually attempting that. Great, I was just curious of what you thought, thank you. Yeah, uh, the others are also definitely uh, a possibility, but I think they are far, farther, farther away in terms of development for them to be able to be rolled out in low and middle income countries. 
So the ones that I've actually highlighted here, the very early treatment, latent, latency reversal, and uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies and uh, immunomodulation. The ones that I've highlighted here are the ones that I think are much more closer to application or to testing, at least testing in low and middle income countries. So how do you actually test this in, uh, uh, how this combination approach works? So as I mentioned, what you have is uh, when someone has HIV infection, and on antiretroviral therapy is you have these latently infected cells that harbor HIV. And the first thing that you, I think you would have to do is to activate these cells with a latency reversal agent so that they start producing virions or HIV proteins at least, so that they can then be recognized by the immune system. And then you can intervene with an immune enhancing agent that then uh, either inhibits the virus or directly kills these uh, infected cells that are now producing virus. So it's a combination of latency reversal uh, plus immune enhancement. And uh, this actually is a approach that we are trying to take here in, uh, in within the, with, the, with the fresh cohort and that I'm going to talk about next. And this, this uh, approach involves a combination of uh, very early treatment. So when you treat people very early, you have low reservoir and you have lower genetic complexity of the virus because you don't give the time for the virus to diversify. Because what happens in chronic HIV infection is that the virus diversifies over time. And the more a person stays without antiretroviral therapy before they go on antiretroviral therapy, the more the virus diversifies in that individual. And the more diverse the virus, the more genetically complex that virus will be and the more more difficult it will be to deal with that uh, particular virus. So I think it's important for people to go on antiretroviral therapy early, as soon as they're infected or as early as possible, as soon as they're diagnosed with HIV. The other thing about chronic HIV infection is that it results in uh, chronic immune activation and inflammation. And so again, if you treat people early, as early as possible, as uh, following infection, or as soon as HIV infection is detected, you will have low inflammation in the body and uh, antiretroviral therapy itself also reduces inflammation. So you treat people early, you reduce inflammation and that could also help these uh, immune boosting agents, including broadly neutralizing antibodies as well as other immune enhancing agents such as vaccines. And uh, then you can boost the immune responses as I said with broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, with vaccines or other uh, immune modulation agents and that might then lead to long-term remission. So what about specifically about low and middle income countries? So remember that the HIV epidemic in low and middle income countries is dominated by uh, women. There are certainly much more women that are living with HIV uh, than, than are men. And most of the HIV cure research that has happened so far, unfortunately has happened in uh, resource rich countries where men are the ones uh, who are predominantly infected. And therefore we haven't had a lot of testing of HIV cure strategies in women. But because there are biological factors that are different between men and women, it is possible that uh, some, of this fact, uh, some of these interventions will work better either in men versus women. And I think it's very important that we test HIV cure strategies. Therefore, uh, particularly in women, in resource limited settings. The other thing about resource limited settings is that the virus subtypes tend to be different. The comorbidities also influence the efficacy and eff effectiveness of these cure strategies might be different and the human genetic factors are also different. Besides the biological factors, there is also the issue of acceptance of HIV cure research. If we don't do this research in resource limited settings, I think it will be a problem when it comes to application of these uh, uh, interventions, even if they are shown to work. As we have seen with COVID, I think it is very important that uh, people understand what is being done and the rationale behind it. And so the more, uh, I think people in low and middle income countries, communities are exposed to this kind of research, the more uh, it will lead to acceptance and accelerated development of products for HIV cure research. And then also I think that there are actually unique opportunities uh, for HIV cure research because of uh, high HIV incidence and prevalence. And with that, 
I just wanted to very briefly touch on the fresh cohort because it is uh, a study that we are doing in a resource limited setting. What we do in this study is that we identify individuals with acute HIV infection and we identify them very, very early. And uh, all our study participants are women. They come to our clinic. These are HIV negative women that come to our clinic in Durban, South Africa. And because there is a high incidence of HIV in this community, we screen for HIV infection twice a week. And through this uh, strategy, we have actually been able to identify some women that got HIV infected and were able to detect them very, very early during the, what we call FIBIC stages one and two before peak viremia. As soon as they got infected, we can detect HIV RNA because we are taking samples from them twice a week. And what we have been able to show is that uh, when you then put these women on antiretroviral therapy immediately, you blunt peak viremia, and you also preserve uh, their CD4 counts as, other, as well as other aspects of their immune response. So early treatment helps uh, to uh, preserve immune responses in these women, but also it helps, it stops virus diversification. What we have also done with this particular group of uh, uh, study participants is that we have tested their viruses, these transmitted founder viruses, then the viruses that were infected with for sensitivity to broadly neutralizing antibodies. The kind of broadly neutralizing antibodies that uh, Marina was talking about that are able to inhibit virus replication. And you have been able to identify some of the broadly neutralizing antibodies that are very effective against these transmitted founder viruses in these women. So for example, CAR-256 and VRC-07 uh, are some of the antibodies that were very effective, showing about 94% bread for the CAP-256 and 94% bread for the VRC-07. So although, although these antibodies don't uh, neutralize all the viruses, we think that a combination of these two antibodies might actually be a good way to intervene in these women. And remember, these, these are women that were treated very early. So the virus also did not have time to diversify and the immune responses are also preserved because they didn't experience a chronic HIV infection because they went into treatment very, very early. So again, uh, Marina showed this, uh, this cartoon. So what we are trying to do is we introduce treatment during acute or early infection. This reduces inflammation and immune activation. It results in limited virus diversification. It, it uh, preserves immune responses. It also reduces the reservoir and the, the genetic complexity of the virus is, is low. And then what we are doing is that after one year of treatment, we will intervene with two broadly neutralizing antibodies. These are the two broadly neutralizing antibodies that we have tested uh, the efficacy against the transmitted founder viruses. So CAP-256 and VRC07. And also we will also intervene with the toll-like receptor agonist. Toll-like receptor agonists have been shown to reverse latency in some instances and also to boost immune responses. And then what we will do is that after treatment with this uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies and toll-like receptor agonists, we will interrupt treatment and we will see whether the virus rebounds. And the purpose of our study is to see whether some of these women that were treated very early can go into long-term remission or whether they will experience virus rebound. So we will monitor for virus rebound we will also study immune responses to see whether these broadly neutralizing antibodies boost immune responses. And also we will uh, be interested to see what is happening to the reservoir characteristics, whether these broadly neutralizing antibodies and the toll like receptor agonists can uh, reduce the viral reservoir. reservoir. So, so in summary, I think that uh, an effective cure or remission uh, of antiretroviral therapy would likely be needed to add the HIV AIDS pandemic, particularly in low and middle income countries. There are several promising strategies that are in the pipeline. And the most, some of the most promising of these strategies are combination immunotherapy. And this is what we are attempting uh, in, our, in our setting with the acute HIV infection in women to try and see whether we can achieve remission. And finally, just to say that these cure strategies and HIV cure research needs to prioritize low and middle income countries, because these are the countries with the high burden of disease, and we will not be able to achieve HIV cure uh, that has public health impact 
if it doesn't impact people in uh, living with HIV in low and middle income countries. And uh, finally, just to uh, acknowledge a lot of folks who participated in some of the uh, work that I described, but also who helped uh, me with some of uh, their slides for this presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you very much.